Welcome to Foster Tales. I'm Kara Ochterberg, co-founder of Who Will Let the Dogs Out, a nonprofit organization that works to raise awareness and resources for homeless dogs and the heroes who fight for them. I'm excited to introduce you to another lifesaver in the world of dog rescue today. The problem of too many dogs dying in our nation's shelters is a complicated and many layered one that so many of us are working hard to solve. But meanwhile, there is one thing just about anyone can do to save a life. They can foster an animal. So, Chris, I wanted to interview you first, talk about fostering with you first, because you were I was my unofficial mentor. I know that I was assigned a mentor, and I can't even remember who that person was, but because you live locally, because we met, and I don't remember how we met. I think through OPH. Yeah. So I it was going to like see what you were doing. I don't know if you remember, but Lily's birth, Lily's birth when she was giving birth to all those puppies um, yeah. and being there for that. It was really cool. And I got to see you fostering in action and see what you were doing. And um, and then you were the person I leaned on many times when I had questions, especially once I started fostering mama dogs. And Anyway, you were always my go-to person, so I wanted to start by interviewing you first. So some of this will be news to me too, but I so I'm going to just ask a few questions and um, we'll see where we go. So first okay. off, like, what made you decide to start fostering? Um, I did not intend to foster. Um, I started with OPH as a volunteer and I was going to take dogs to um, some adoption events, which are events where adoptable dogs are taken to meet people and to give people information about the organization. Um, I had actually had a not great experience fostering for another rescue with just one foster dog. And I said, never again, I'm never doing this again. So I said, okay, um, I really still want to rescue I'm going to do a transport and I'm going to take a dog to an event. Um, and it was it, one of the reasons we went with OPH is because my daughter was only 10 at the time and I'm a single mom and I was looking for something that we could do together. And it was hard to find things that would allow someone under the age of 18 to participate. Um, so we were lucky to find this rescue that was like, sure, sign the waiver, be that, make sure you're there with them to be responsible for them. And your kid can totally participate. Um, now back then in OPH to transport a dog, you had to fill out the forms that were actually the foster forms. Um, and this is key to the story because I was already technically an approved foster before I ever intended to foster. Um, <laughs> so you know, we have a, a Facebook page um, where they post dogs that need, you know, a foster. Like, you know, if, if they can commit to saving this dog, if you are willing to foster them, it truly makes you feel like you are a key part. Like that by just stepping up and saying, I will help this life somewhere in a whole nother state is saved. Um, and for my very first foster, I saw this picture of this black lab mix and she had this fear in her eyes. And I could tell that the shelter had tried to dress her up to make her look more appealing to a potential foster. They had put like a little feather boa around her neck and a little pink ribbon um, by her ear. And, um, and she was pregnant and she was going to be euthanized the next day. Um, and OPH posted her that morning and they said, can anybody help? Um, and her picture stayed in my mind all day. I think I checked the volunteer Facebook page a thousand times to see if anybody had stepped up for this dog and no one, no one could. Um, so I jumped into the very, very deep end of fostering with my very first OPH foster and brought home a pregnant, a pregnant dog. Um, fun side to that story. Molly is still here today, eight years later, <laughs> was my first foster. And as kind of a joke of the foster failure, um, she, she was a failure, so she's still here, um, but we have fostered over 60 dogs since her and obviously not failed on all of them, but she was obviously just a, do a dog that was meant to be in my life. She was meant to bring me into fostering, um, and I was meant to be a part of saving her life and bringing her puppies into this world and finding homes for them, them too. So that's how I kind of wound up in fostering, and it was a, a really cool experience, and uh, OPH we didn't have a formal mentoring program at the time we do now, which I think is huge. But even though we didn't have a formal program, I had informal mentors and I had an amazing um, woman named Laurie who was a nurse and she stepped up um, 
my background is actually in nursing. I don't do patient care anymore, but prior to fostering, I was an ER nurse and I had done mother baby nursing for a while. And they were like, Oh, you went ER nurse. You can totally handle this, which by the way, there really is no direct correlation between ER nursing and delivering <laughs> puppy, but they felt if I could handle the pressure of, of, del- you know, um, working in an ER that delivering puppies should be okay. And for the most part, it is, it's a really natural process and mama dogs do what they are, you know, nature has taught them to do. So um, that's how I wound up in fostering. It was nothing I actually intended to do, Um, but it's obviously something I was meant to do. And I've been doing it for eight years since. Um, And it's been a really amazing experience. It, it is. It's been amazing to watch too. So Chris keeps mentioning OPH, and I'm I'm gonna give you information about all the different rescues that we interview with. And OPH stands for Operation Pause for Homes, which, full disclosure, is also the rescue that I began fostering with, and and still continue um, to foster with. So um, we're gonna probably throw that name out there a bit. Um, so Chris. What was what was it like in terms of was it what you expected? I mean, you did jump into the super deep end by going to a, you know, taking in a pregnant dog. Most people just take in a dog um, yeah. to start with. And so you're a single mom. You work full time. You had had a 10 year old at the time. So how did it work out? Was it what you expected? Yeah. And in addition to all of that, I have a chronic illness. So um And my daughter was going through some things at the time too. So I really didn't know what to expect from fostering. I did not have any friends or acquaintances that were, were fosters. And I had a lifelong love of dogs. I had had, you know, a few dogs growing up. Um, I had one personal dog at the time. um, And that, that was it. So like, I, I really didn't have a good idea of what I was, was doing. And Mm -hmm. in hindsight, and I look back and see how much I've learned over the years. I'm kind of astounded um, over all, all the knowledge that I have gained. Um, but I didn't know what to expect from fostering. But I can tell you what I got from fostering. Um, you know, being a single parent can be really stressful. Um, and there was a lot of times where it felt like I was just trying to keep my head above water. And I felt like I wasn't really doing a lot of quality stuff with my daughter. It felt like everything we were doing was just because it it had to be done to get through the day. So once we started fostering, we had a project, a dog that we were working on together to take care of this dog, to help find this dog at home. And that might've meant um, taking pictures of the dog together to put them on social media, or it might've meant giving medication to a dog or simple things just like, um, you know, feeding the dog or taking the dog for walks together. Um, When we went to adoption events, to help advertise our dog. Um, you know, Caitlin was young. She was 10. Um, it took her no time to get in there and start preaching about OPH, to preach about fostering, <laughs> to listen about our foster dog. Um, and I really think that was a big part of her developing into who she became because, you know, I see a lot of younger people today who have a lot of anxiety about talking to people that they don't know, or even about like, picking up a phone or or calling for something. And I, I think that advocating for our foster dogs and going to things like adoption events helped Caitlin to develop the skills, to be able to talk to people um, and to, to do things like that. And we also gained a whole family. Um, You know, Caitlin had some struggles as she was growing up and the OPH people were, were there for her. Well, we went to adoption events. They made her feel like a million bucks. Like, so in, in other parts of her lives where she wasn't feeling so confident or secure in herself, we would go to these adoption events and people would praise her for the work she was doing with the dogs or praise her for how many raffle tickets she was able to sell because she was a very determined raffle ticket seller. I think sometimes <laughs> gave money just so she would leave them alone. Um, but she she did a job. And, you know, so she she found connections in the rescue that she wasn't finding um, in other areas of her life right then. Um, and I will forever be grateful for that, you know? Um, and as a single mom, when I had my own struggles, it was frequently people in the rescue who were like, what can I do to help you? So you don't just, it's not just you doing something for a dog. Like there's a lot that as a foster and a volunteer, you gain in return that you never, ever even 
imagined, you know, I mean, look at you eight years later and we're still friends and, you know, um, you know, outside of rescue. And I, I just think that there's all these things that come along with it that you couldn't have imagined um, until you get involved in it. And uh, sometimes people who are in rescue are there because they do better with animals than they do with people. Um, sometimes I may be one of those people, but they're also some of the most loving and caring and loyal people that you will ever meet. And they are the people who will do anything they can to help an animal or to help somebody else. So it's a really great group of people to get involved with and get, get to know. Yeah. You know, you, you did this thinking that you were going to help one dog save a life. Yeah. You were going to save a life. Well, probably, I don't know how many puppies she had, but like a whole bunch of lives. And, and then the amazing part is, and I've had the same experience, they end up, you know, saving you in some ways, um, not in, in terms of helping you raise your daughter and, you know, bringing some really amazing experiences to your life. And I've definitely seen that, definitely had that happen. Um, but there had to been like some really hard things that come along with fostering. Can you speak a little bit to that? I know that's something that people are very hesitant. They're afraid of giving up a dog, um, how hard that will be, um, and other parts of it. So for you, what, what has been hard about fostering? There can be dogs that are very hard to say, see you later to like, farewell, good luck. Um, and it, for me, it tends to be the dogs who have been with me the longest or the dogs who came to me kind of in the worst shape, the dogs that were really, really scared and that bonding to me helped them come out of their shell and then sending them on to their new family can be, um, it, it, you know, it can, it can hurt your heart a little bit. Um, have I cried over some of the dogs that have left? Absolutely. Um, but I'm crying for me. I'm not really crying for them because they go on. And one of the really cool things about fostering in the world today is social media, because um, I frequently um, connect with my adopters on social media. So I get to see these dogs in their forever homes and I get to see them having their Christmases in their homes or like some of the adopters celebrate um, their dog's birthdays. Or, you know, we talked about Lily earlier we set up in a, a Facebook page just for her, the adopters of her puppies so that we could keep in touch with Lily and her puppies. Um, so once you get over that acute, my heart hurts a little bit from saying farewell, there's all this joy in seeing these dogs in their new homes. Um, and frequently my way of coping with those feelings of I'm a little bit sad is I hurry up and bring in a new foster so that my attention is now on this new foster. Um, I, I have had the experience. So I have fostered two pregnant moms. And in each one of those litters, we lost one of the puppies. Um, and that was hard. Like, did I cry? Yes. But then I got to go on and see the rest of the litter who never would have had a chance be born and grow up and get adopted into these amazing homes, you know? Um, so I think emotions are normal and rescue is like everything else. They come with a variety of emotions, um, but the joy far outweighs the sadness for me. Um, and I, I, it's that kind of cliche thing they say online where it's like, you know, um, I would rather be sad over saying goodbye to them than sad over knowing that they, they died in a shelter somewhere because no one would, was willing to, to give that for them, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I just think that, um, again, it's okay. And to go back to my daughter again, I think that it's helped her learn how to process emotions. I remember one time, um, we had a really cool experience. We fostered a dog from Afghanistan for a soldier. So this soldier found this puppy in Afghanistan and worked with a rescue to bring this dog to the United States so that she could, you know, give him a home in the United States when she returned. However, the dog made it to the U S three months before she did. So we, we fostered this dog for three months until her deployment was over. Um, and that was a really different situation because typically when I, I get a foster, that foster does not have a person, you know, our goal is to find them someone. So this was unique in that this dog already had someone, they just needed someone to take care of them until she could be here. Um, it was a lot of fun because 
she had access to Amazon. So I would come home and there would be a pack of boxes on my front step that she had sent items to her dog. Um, or she would send extra things for my dog. Um, I had him during Christmas. So I took him to get pictures with Santa for Christmas. And then when it was 1201 in Afghanistan on Christmas morning, I sent her this picture of this dog with Santa. I did not wait to do this. Um, in Afghanistan, they, their culture is much different towards dogs for the most part, but there are some locals that will help them save the dogs. And she took this picture of Santa across the world and showed these people this dog down in the U.S. and stuff. So that was like, like, wow, like this is happening across the world because of me. Um, but he was with us for three months. So the night before he was going to go home, I was in my backyard and he was running around and I was crying because I was sad. Like, you know, like I was going to miss him. And Caitlin came out and she was like, mom, are you sad because he's leaving? And I said, yeah, I am. I said, I just need to cry it out. And she said, okay. And she just sat there quietly and let me process my emotions. And it was like, I think it kind of taught her that sadness is okay. It's not, it's not bad to be sad. It's okay. And you can feel those emotions and you can move past them. And then you can get back into the joy of this dog being in their home. So there's, there's not a single bad emotion I've experienced that would say fostering wasn't worth it. Um, and some of the other things that have been hard in fostering are just the silly little things like the dogs with like GI upsets or the dogs that are a little mm -hmm. bit harder to potty train than others. And you learn very quickly that you have to crate train your foster dogs because that is a huge help with housebreaking. Um, but I, I think the biggest reason that people don't want to foster is because they don't want to say goodbye, but it's, it's not really goodbye. It's like, see you later. And on that note, I have frequently um, pet sat some of my fosters for their adopters later on. Um, just past summer, I think for, I think I, I pet sat two of them. Um, and they both came for like, like a week. And my deal with the foster or the adopters was, hey, just make a donation to the rescue. Um, and it was amazing because I got to see these dogs that I loved so much. They came back to me to, to hang out. Um, they were in an environment that they were familiar with. Um, they already knew my dogs. Their adopters were comfortable with me um, and the rescue got a donation. So it's it's not always goodbye forever. Like sometimes they come back to visit or you get to go see them. Um, so, you know, yes, there are emotions, but they're, they're totally worth it. Yeah, you said that really well. Um, so you have a foster right now. You're still fostering. Can you introduce us to who you've got right now? And yeah, tell us a little I, bit about like the journey, like where, where he came from and how it's going. Cause you've had him for what, a week? Yes. He came to me last Friday night. Um, so let me go outside with him because he is happiest in the backyard with my other dogs. And actually in, when you see this outside, the little black dog, Molly, that was my first foster. That was the one that came to me pregnant. The hound dog was another, um, foster dog who actually came from Ruff, R-U-F-F, -F, which is actually where my current foster dog, Bobby Wayne, came from. Um, and a cool thing about Alabama. Yeah. The cool thing about my hand dog, Bambi, when she first came to OPH, she didn't come right away because she was so scared at Ruff. They weren't even sure that she was going to be adopt adoptable. So when you see her out in the yard, paying it forward with Bobby Wayne, like just kind of keep that in mind. So. so the little hound dog with the brown with the white spots, that's Bambi. Um, and that is Bobby Wayne getting a drink from the water bowl right now. And Molly is the lab mix over there. Um, a little bit about Bobby Wayne. He did come last Friday. Um, he was terrified. Um, he was doing what we call pancaking, which is basically trying to make himself as flat to the ground as a pancake because he was so scared. He just wanted to like melt into the ground. Um, I had to pick him up and carry him to my car and put him in the back seat of my car. Um, you might not be able to tell, but he weighs 50 pounds. So that wasn't an easy feat to pick up a dog who was trying <laughs> to put himself into the ground. Um, but what was interesting about him is even though he was so scared, um, I rode in the back seat of my car with him on the way home from transport, which is about, I don't know, like 40 minutes from my house. And he pressed himself against me the entire time. Like, even though he was scared, he desperately wanted that human connection and affection. Um, <laughs> as you can see he's enjoying his time rolling around in the grass um so I brought him home uh he's been with us for like, about a week he is at best guess about a year and a half old he is a male they're listed him as a shepherd mix but it's really kind of 
a gas. Um, he is super energetic, but he also lays down. Like he will run around my backyard, but then when we go inside, he'll lay down in his crate and, and relax. Generally, when we come out here, he and my dogs chase each other around the entire backyard. Um, I am really grateful for my backyard, but I have not had my backyard the entire time I was fostering. Um, when I first started, we actually had a playground out here and no fence. So I, it is possible to foster without a backyard, but it is also, also very nice to have a backyard when you foster. Mm -hmm. uh, you have people who foster in their apartments or their condos, like it can all, it can all be done. Does he have a stubby tail? He does. <laughs> here he comes come here bud. come here we actually call him buddy so you can see this is the pancaking he's what they call submissive but he's very sweet <laughs> and to see the progress that he has made in the past week has been incredible like when we first came there's a sliding glass door from my backyard into my house he was terrified he could not cross the threshold he just would not do it I would have to put a leash on him and basically kind of drag him into the house like no food was going to, to to you know convince him that it was okay to come through that threshold and then earlier this week I had the door open and next thing I know he came flying into the house like running into the house up the stairs <laughs> through the kitchen door and I thought how cool like he Aww. he <laughs> you know he's not scared anymore so every day he shows me that there's something else that that he's not scared of and you know, he has started playing with some toys. Like he'll pick up a ball and toss it up in the air for himself to play with. He runs around with my dogs. Um, so it's just really cool to see him go from this dog that was scared of everything at transport to coming here and learning how to be a dog, you know, learning yeah. to get affection from people. Yeah, he's a cutie. So does he have an adopter yet? He does not have anyone interested in adopting him yet. Um, He's totally welcome to stay with me for as long as he needs to, but I definitely want him to find his family. So we'll put the information um, in our notes. So if anybody's interested in this handsome guy, he is really cute. Um, I'm sure he's just gonna get more and more happy and open the longer he stays with you. Um, so Chris, one last question before we wrap this up. Do you have any advice for anybody who's like, thinking about fostering because I keep saying right now that that's what we need more than anything else in this current crisis that we are facing in our shelters and um, fostering could save so many lives not just the dog you bring home but like I always say that you know the the dog you make room for in the shelter so do you have any advice for people who are thinking about shelter um, about fostering I do. If you are scared to make a commitment to a dog, which is understandable if you don't know what you're getting into, um, consider even just doing fostering for like a vacation coverage for someone um, or even just doing like a weekend um, with Operation Paul's for Homes, like our transports um, of dogs that are coming into foster care usually come on a Friday night. And like sometimes people will say, I can foster a dog but I can't take them until Sunday. So all I need is somebody to pick this dog up on Friday night and keep them until Sunday. And then I can foster. So maybe start out just being that person who goes on a Friday night and keeps them until Sunday. Like that's only 48 hours. And I have to tell you something, going to a transport is one of the coolest things ever. Um, I've only done it for Operation Pals for Homes, but um, how it works is we um, have these kind of like designated parking lots where we meet, right? It's kind of funny because it's, usually later in the day, like, you know, seven, it might be getting kind of dark and there's all these cars that pull into the parking lot. Um, and we're all kind of waiting around and then like a van will pull up and they open the door and it's all these dogs and the dogs start unloading. And you just get to see that each one of these dogs coming off a van is a dog that was saved because of a rescue, because a foster said, I can, I can help. Um, and that's one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. And you could, you could do that. You could do that just by committing to a weekend um, or sometimes around the holidays, people don't can't commit to fostering because they're like, I have to go away for Christmas or Thanksgiving, and I can't commit to a dog unless I know someone can watch that dog for me on Thanksgiving if they're not adopted by then. So if you don't have plans for Thanksgiving or you have plans that could accommodate having a dog in your house for a couple of days, you could be the piece that makes it possible for someone to commit to that dog just by saying, I'll cover Thanksgiving or I'll cover Christmas or I'll cover 4th of July. So if you are nervous to get in to a longer commitment, 
consider doing something like holiday coverage or just a weekend coverage um, just to get a feel for it and see what it's like. Um, I will say for every dog I fostered, usually the first two or three days, I have a little bit of a, what have I done? Because it's a <laughs> adjustment for everyone, right? Like some of these dogs may have never even lived in a home, like in the South dogs aren't always welcome in the house. Um, and these dogs were from a shelter. So like, I'll tell you, like for Bobby Wayne, he is a year and a half old from his records. I can tell that he has been in the shelter since August. So for the past six months of his very short life, he has been in a shelter environment. And then he rode on a van from down South to Maryland and then to me in Pennsylvania. Um, and then I brought him into my house with ceiling fans and hardwood floors and sliding glass doors and like all these things that he might not have ever seen. And it was a huge adjustment for him. Um, and you just have to remind yourself that if you just give yourself a couple of days, you're gonna get over that hump and it's going to be fine. But even as an experienced foster, even 60 plus dogs later and eight years later, pretty much every dog I bring home for the first couple of days, I'm like, oh my gosh. And then now look at after a week later and he's already keyed into the routines of our home. Like he has seen my dogs run into their crate for dinner time. So he knows when the food bowl comes out, he runs into his crate. He does exactly what, what they do. So the change can happen. It doesn't always happen so fast, but it can happen so fast. And usually within a week's time, it's a totally different story. And you get to look and see what's happened in the past week. And that's, that's really incredible. Like how often do you really get to look at something and say, wow, I was, a, I was a part of this. And, you know, you get to watch this dog walking or running or playing. And you know, that if it wasn't for you, that dog might not be here. Like you can take, you know, ownership of that, that can be part of your legacy. And that's really, really, that's really cool. It's, it it's really, really cool. cool. It's really cool. Thank you for giving me this little bit of time. I know that you've shared some really wonderful stories and hopefully encouraged some more people to take a chance on fostering. Um, so I really appreciate your time and really grateful that you saved this guy and we will put information up and hopefully help you find an adopter for that sweetheart. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing and everybody else out there. Just give it a try. Thanks.